All right, welcome everyone who's joining us. Um, if you're here for a very cool um, wildlife talk, you are in the right place. Uh, we're gonna get started very soon. We'll just make sure everybody's logged in. And if you do get disconnected from Zoom, you can always watch this webinar from our YouTube channel. Okay. And just to let you know, chat is enabled. So if at any time you have any questions or you want to ask um, our presenters today any questions, you can use the chat option. You can also use the Q&A option. So that is going to be monitored um, from both ends. And if you want to say hello in the chat and where you're tuning in from, you can also do that as well. And I am Miss Jackie, uh, one of the youth librarians from the Santa Clara City Library. So welcome. And the two um, park interpret or interpretive, I'm sorry, did I say it wrong? All good. <laughs> interpretive rangers? Okay, there we go. So we have Rachel and Olivia here with us today and they are from the Don Edward San Francisco Bay Area National Wildlife Refuge. And we're really excited to have them here today with us. So I think, okay, it's 2.02. I think it's time to get started. So I'm going to turn it over to Rachel and Olivia. Great. Thank you so much, Jackie. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We're so glad to be here with you all. My name is Rachel Cooley. I am the interpretive specialist with the San Francisco Bay Wildlife Society. And I'm joined by Olivia. Hi, everyone. My name is Olivia Polis, and I am the interpretive associate for the San Francisco Bay Wildlife Society. We have a wonderful presentation for you today, and I'm very excited. So if you want to get started, Rachel. Yes, so Olivia and I will be taking you all on a virtual hike of the Don Edwards San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge, uh, which we like to call um, Don Edwards or the Refuge for short because it is a long name. So we'll be going on a virtual hike. We'll be talking about some tips and tricks to view wildlife and also recreate responsibly. So how to enjoy nature in a safe and fun way. So the Don Edwards uh, Refuge has two locations. One is in Alviso, which is in San Jose, and our second location is in Fremont. So this picture is of our location in Fremont. And we just like to show this picture to give you all a good idea of how peaceful and beautiful and welcoming our refuge is. And we hope to have in-person programs soon so that we can all gather together and enjoy the space together um, but we again, we thank you for joining us virtually. <clears throat> and whenever we're in our everyday lives enjoying the outdoors, it's important for us to reflect and acknowledge the indigenous people who have lived and steward this land for many years. So we would like to acknowledge that the San Francisco Bay Area is the ancestral homeland of many bands of indigenous people that we collectively call today, <clears throat> excuse me, as Ohlone people. Uh, the refuge lands occupies um, ancestral homeland of the Tamian and the Chechenya Ohlone people. And this land is very in important and integral to their identity and culture. Um, so that's something we like to remember as we talk about this land and as we continue the, the legacy of stewardship as a national wildlife refuge. So what exactly do we do at a wildlife refuge? This is a chance for you all to um, use that chat and we'd like you just to guess or if you already know, um, what do we do at a wildlife refuge? And there's no wrong answers. We wanna hear whatever you think. I see a comment for you, Birdwatch, yes. Definitely. <clears throat> uh, 
Ms. Thomas, come in. Hike, yeah, so there's definitely a lot of opportunities for hiking, enjoying the outdoors, on trails only. So those are all great answers. So what we do at a wildlife refuge, we protect habitats to conserve America's fish, wildlife, and plants. We provide access to public lands and water. We provide wildlife-oriented recreation, like you've all mentioned, hiking, uh, walking, bike riding, um, taking nature photography, <clears throat> also wildlife viewing. Uh, we conduct environmental education and interpretive programs like the one you're joining today. And we also uh, protect migratory birds, so birds that travel distances um, depending on the season. And we also monitor threatened and endangered species, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So those are the main things we do at a wildlife refuge. So how exactly did a national wildlife refuge system start? Uh, because we're not the only national wildlife refuge, there's more than 500 uh, refuges across the nation, um, but the whole system itself was established in 1903. Um, Pelican Island was the first refuge established in Florida. Um, and it was established with the help of people just like you and me. Um, one person in particular that helped was Paul Krogel, who was pictured here. Paul was a German immigrant and he was a bird lover. He loved birds. <clears throat> and at the time, excuse me. At the time, there weren't many laws to protect birds. Let me take it. Yeah, and yeah, the, like Rachel was saying, there's not many laws to protect birds, and they were all end up losing um, a huge amount of the population uh, due to plume hunting. So this was where they would actually take their feathers. Um, the big fashion then was for women's hats was big feathers, um, and so unfortunately, with no laws around hunting and poaching, this became a huge problem. So Paul came in and got some group of people together and eventually established the first National Wildlife Refuge with Pelican Island, along with the help of President Theodore Roosevelt. So that gives you a good time period there of the first National Wildlife Refuge, which eventually led to the creation of the National Wildlife Refuge System. And this is our mission here. This is what we get to work toward every day. Um, and it's a little bit different than some of the sister agencies that you guys might know about with National Park Service, which is you know, really focused on those visitor experiences. And we have a lot of um, amazing benefits for people like us to go out and recreate on the refuge and um, get a good benefit for our present and future generations. But we also do really focus on conservation. So that's actually protecting the habitat so that these species get to live out their lives. Awesome. Thanks, Olivia, for stepping in. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, so now we're going to talk about the organization that Olivia and I work for, the San Francisco Bay Wildlife Society. And we are a friends group. Um, so what makes someone a good friend? Uh, think about your friends, your best friends, and you can type in the chat, what makes someone a good friend? Um, so we are a, a friends group, friends of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We're also a nonprofit group. So we support the Fish and Wildlife Service through education programs, um, interpretation programs, and also research activity. Uh, since the Fish and Wildlife Service is a federal agency, they're not um, able to raise funds on their own. So that's where we come in, like a friend um, who's short on money or needs money. That's who we are we're able to fundraise and um, support the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Wildlife Service, specifically at the Don Edwards Refuge. All right, now, so since we're on a virtual hike, we're now gonna talk about how to recreate responsibly. Um, so here are some tips that we have. Um, maybe you all have some tips too. I know that a lot of people have been going out more, so that's great. If you have any suggestions, you can type those in the chat too, because we're all learning together. Uh, but these are some tips that we have. Uh, go with a friend or family member. So you have a companion, you have company. Um, if anything goes wrong, you have someone there to help you. Tell someone where you plan to go and for how long. It's always good to have someone know where you are just in case anything happens. Uh, beforehand, you want to plan your hike and also bring a map. Just so you know where you're going to go, where you're going to start, where you're going to end, how long the hike will take, and so forth. Also check the weather and dress accordingly. So you wanna see if it's sunny, if you need to bring a hat, if it's cold, if you need to bring extra layers, um, those types of things. Also very important is bring enough food and water. I know myself, I bring a lot of snacks and water 
uh, just so I don't get hangry on my hike, just so I know I can make it through and I have all the fuel I need. Uh, also, we want to stay on trail um, for your safety and also the safety of the plants and the animals. Um, if you go on trail, there's chances that you might get hurt or you might brush against a, a plant that you might get a reaction to like poison oak. So it's very important that we stay on trail for our safety. And lastly, uh, dispose of trash properly. There's a saying to pack it in and pack it out. So whatever you bring with you, make sure you bring it out whenever you leave a park or refuge or any open space. We wanna make sure that this land is kept clean and healthy. And as I mentioned, um, many of our outdoor spaces are culturally and spiritually important for many people. So we wanna make sure to keep them clean. All right, um, so we are a national wildlife refuge. So here are some tips and tricks to view wildlife because that's what it's all about, seeing cool animals out in nature and saying, hey, I got to see this and share what you saw with friends. So here are some tips. Uh, be aware of your surroundings, check what's around you, um, take some time to really look um, deeply into what's around you. Maybe there's a bird's nest and a tree. So take that time to really see what's around you. Use your senses, of course, your eyes, also your ears to listen to what's around. Maybe you hear something um, making noise in a tree. It might be a bird, might be something else. Um, speak and walk softly. So animals, um, they can be intimidated by us. So we wanna make sure that we're walking and we're not talking too loud so that we don't scare these animals away because we wanna see them, we wanna get a bit up close. Um, also be patient. So it might take a while for an animal to maybe get used to you being around. So it might take some time um, to actually view wildlife for them um, to come out to out of anywhere that they're hiding. And also don't get too close for your own safety and for the safety of the animal. So make sure you keep a good distance whenever you're doing your wildlife viewing. Um, and lastly, it's always good to bring binoculars and field guides so you can identify any cool plant or animal species that you see on your hikes or walks. All right, and the more tricks um, to see what's around you, um, you can use SCAT, which is a scientific name for poop, um, and tracks to see the signs of wildlife on your hikes. So SCAT um, on the trail or tracks in the mud or ground. Um, see, uh, oh, I see a question there. I'll answer that in a, question, in a minute. Um, these are all clues to paint a picture of what wildlife is about, because. Sometimes animals are nocturnal, so we won't be able to see them in the day, but if we see um, their scat or tracks, then it could give us a clue to where they are if they've been here before. So it's sort of like a mystery um, game that you're playing when you use scat and tracks to identify wildlife. Um, and these are some questions you can, you can use when you, you see a track, um, how many toes are there? Um, does it have two or four legs? What shape is the print? Um, the type of shaped feet? Um, when you're looking at scat, you want to see like the size, um, how much is it, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. All right, so attractive tracks. So these are common tracks that you'll probably see, especially at the refuge, but also in different parks and outdoor spaces wherever you go. Um, so we have um, the first one. Let me click Olivia. There we go. Um, so these, these tracks that you'll see um, are birds without wet feet. Um, so you'll notice that their feet aren't so big and wide because birds, you know, they fly often, so they don't need big feet to roam about. So when you see that track, you know that's a bird uh, without wet feet. So these are all clues to kind of narrow down what animal is about. Um, we have web feet, birds with web feet. So these are sort of waterfowl birds like ducks. They'll have a track like this. Then we have a uh, paw print um, with the claws. And if you see this track, um, chances are it's either a wolf or a dog. So many of you probably have dogs that so you're more familiar uh, with this track. All right, then we have a similar print, uh, like a paw print, but without the claws. And if you see this print um, or track, you know that it's either a coo or a cat or it's relative like a mountain lion. So this is a good track to know because Maybe you're out where mountain lions are and you see this track, you might think, oh, maybe this is not where I need to be right now, it's not safe. Um, so you'll notice that the paw and then without um, the claws because these sort of animals can retract their claws. And then we have tracks of um, rodents. You'll see they're smaller. Um, they're sort of look like our hands are 
prints. So they have the long, the long fingers, and they have small feet in the front and larger um, feet in the back. So that's how you can tell if it's a rodent or one of those relatives. And lastly, we have raccoons. Raccoons are all over the place. You probably see them where you live. And they have a very interesting track. It's sort of like a human hand. And we know that raccoons are very agile. They use their hands to get into things. So that's a track that's good to notice because it looks like our hand and you'll know that it's a raccoon. So who pooped on the refuge? I'm gonna talk about scat for a second, talk about poop. It's a good way to know what wildlife is about. Um, I just wanna say that you should not ever pick up scat. It's not safe for you. So please don't pick up scat. It's just good to view at a distance. So if you're looking at scat on the trail um, in spheres, and I have an example here, um, it's not real scat. This is used for educational purposes, it's fake. Um, but this is a sphere sort of scat. So if you see that, um, you'll know that it's a rabbit or a relative of a rabbit. This one in particular is a cottontail rabbit. Um, if you see scat in a sphere that's elongated, those are rodents, shrews, deers, and their relatives. Um, and then if you see scat that long, it looks like a cord. Um, this would be a, a wolf, a cougar, coyote, bear, or raccoon. And then we all have seen bird poop before probably, and those are sort of long and thin, a bit liquidy. Um, so those are all clues to see what wildlife is roaming uh, where you roam. Good clues to know. And we have a little identifying game now. So this is definitely a chance for you to go in the chat um, and see if we can identify, Rachel and I got to see these this week, to see if we can identify what kind of animal made these tracks. So you can see We've got one up at the top here, and we can see if you have any guesses to what that might be, whether it be, you know, something similar, but we see those kind of soft pads and love to hear some guesses to what that might be. And if you have any guesses, you can put them in the chat. Um, cat, dog, wolf, <clears throat> cat or cougar. All good guesses. Nice. Those are all really good guesses. You noticed the, you know, the four pads there. And our best guess is that this is actually a young gray fox. So you can see those little soft um, paw pads there. Um, and then the next one, which was cool, both in the same spot. Um, you might notice those long fingers. And if you have any guesses, it's very similar to one that Rachel showed on the previous slide. You have a response for raccoon, rodent. Nice. Raccoon. You are correct. It is a raccoon track. And these went all the way down the marsh. We got to see them this week. Um, you could watch, <laughs> see exactly how it had gone through the mud. So it's a cool way to see what animals had been there because it was probably really early in the morning when no one was around, but we got a little sign that it was there. Um, and we'll do a quick switch here because these are all of the National Wildlife Refuges in the Bay Area and on the Monterey Peninsula here. Um, so just to give you a little bit better idea of where we're talking about, um, you can see there on the map, Don Edwards, San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge, pretty much takes up the entire shoreline of the South San Francisco Bay. And um, our refuge, Don Edwards, along with San Pablo Bay there up north and Salinas River National Wildlife Refuge all the way down there near Monterey um, are all public. So they're open to the public for hiking, recreation, fishing, uh, hunting during some seasons um, and all that that you can get outside and enjoy those. Um, San Pablo and Don Edwards are also both urban refuges. So we get a special designation there because we are so close to our amazing urban populations here. Um, and then the other ones that you see are all actually closed refuges. So that means that they're not open to the public because of a very fragile ecosystem that hosts mostly endangered species. So these are habitats that our biologists are closely monitoring to make sure that um, populations are staying in good numbers. Um, and these are a few of those species that I'm talking about. So Ellicott Slough National Wildlife Refuge, which is in the Santa Cruz area, was created to protect this little salamander here, the California tiger salamander. They're really cute, um, but they also really rely on water. And that is something you will probably all know we're lacking a little bit of in California right now. So 
Um, it's considered an endangered species and our biologists have been monitoring to make sure that it has enough water levels because it needs water to eat and breed and continue on its life. Um, we also have Farallon Islands National Wildlife Refuge, which on a good, not foggy day in San Francisco, you can actually see from San Francisco, it's about 30 miles off of the coast. Um, and it was an important nesting habitat for the common muir, which is a bird that you can see the little black birds at the front of that photo there, along with the elephant seals, which are that kind of big brown mass of elephant seals over there. And so the Farallons are protected there. And we do have teams of biologists that get to live out there part time to help um, study these birds and the seals um, and make sure that they're all doing well. And we lastly have the Antioch Dunes National Wildlife Refuge, which is the first National Wildlife Refuge to be created just to protect an insect, being the Lang's Metalmark butterfly. And this pretty little butterfly uh, relies on the plants that grow at the Antioch Dunes Refuge. And it was very exciting that it was able to be created just to protect this tiny little butterfly. And um, they're slowly bringing its population back to historic levels. And this is our Environmental Education Center. So this is where Rachel and I get to work every week, which is wonderful. Um, it's in Alviso at Don Edwards. And it's where we get to teach the public and you all um, about Don Edwards, which was established in 1972 after a group of people noticed that we were losing a lot of our shoreline to development. Things were, the wetlands were being filled in and developed on. They built, you know, businesses and homes on them. Um, and so this group got together to protect what was remaining. So we have lost about 90% of our wetlands that used to rim the edge of the bay. Um, and it was in a very important moment when Senator Don Edwards, who was our California Senator, helped sign the bill to create the refuge. So they renamed it after him in 1995, which is why we keep referring to it as Don Edwards was because of the Senator. Um, it was an important habitat for so many species, but especially our bird species and very specifically species that we have that migrate here during the year. Um, so that's 280 species of bird, not just number of bird, different types of birds. Um, and they, a lot of them travel on what is called the Pacific Flyway. So you can think of the Pacific Flyway as an interstate highway. It's like if you're out on a road trip and you're going all the way down from Alaska all the way to South America, and you need places to stop, rest, and refuel. And that's what the Bay Area and specifically the refuge gets to be for those birds. Um, they get to stop, hang out, rest for a bit. Um, some species stay the entire winter, some stop there for a bit and then continue going south. Um, and there's flyways all the way across the US, but we get to be a part of the Pacific Flyway. Um, and a few of those birds that use that flyway um, one of my favorites is the black necked stilt. Um, so I'm going to have you guess in the chat while I talk about it. Um, if you see those pink little legs that the black necked stilt has, it has the second longest leg to body ratio of any bird on the planet. So there's one other bird that has a longer leg to body ratio. If you see those pink legs and I want you to guess in the chat and all after I finish talking about it, here, Rachel, will tell me if you guys had any guesses about what bird it is. Uh, but I like those little ones. Looks like they're wearing a little tuxedo. Um, we also have the American Robin, which is pretty recognizable, but you can see those orange feathers underneath its wings. Um, and it doesn't necessarily migrate as far as some of these other species. Um, and it does like hanging out here during the year um, because we do have such nice weather during the winter. Um, and you'll definitely, a bird that you could see in your own backyard or at your school or in your local park. Um, and then lastly, the Northern Shoveler, which you can probably tell is a type of duck that we have that likes to hang out here during the winter. And you can see that really big bill, which is a good way to be able to identify it because not that many other duck species have that big, it's what we call a spatulate bill. So it kind of sounds like spatula, you, uses it kind of like a spoon, like you and I would use to get our cereal in the morning. He will actually go across the water with that big bill and kind of vacuum little creatures, little insects, other type of crustaceans and other aquatic invertebrates off of the water. Um, and they like hanging out during the salt marsh, which we'll be able to talk about some habitats next. Um, but I would like to hear if anybody could guess what the longest leg to body ratio bird we have on the planet is. Yes, we had a guess for ostrich and many people guessed flamingo. Yay, and ostrich is a great guest too. That's up there on the list, but yes, flamingo. And so it's funny because the black neck still is a tiny little bird, um, but it's long, long legs it uses to walk through that shallow water and through the mud. Um, and you can see it's kind of what um, we would necessarily call a knee is actually more like functions like an ankle so that they can walk forward in the water with those long legs um, and get little, little creatures out of the mud that it likes to eat. 
And now Rachel's gonna talk about some of our endangered species. Yeah, so we have two endangered species that call the refuge home. But first, what does endangered mean? Um, I'd like you all to type in the chat what you think endangered mean, means and why are some animals and plants endangered? Why is that? I'll give you a moment to type in the chat. Almost gone, yes. Good responses. Habit for habit tip cats are going away. Yes, great. These are all great answers. So yes, um, when an animal is endangered, it means their populations are very low and they're at risk of going extinct. Um, so that's where we try to come in as a national wildlife refuge and provide habitat so that their populations can rebound and be more stable. So I'm going to talk about two endangered species that call the refuge home. Um, both of these species are endemic to the San Francisco Bay, so they're not found anywhere else in the world, which is another reason why we try to protect their habitat so they can continue to live here. Um, these species are also nocturnal, so unfortunately uh, we won't be able to see them during the day. Um, they're only awake during the night um, or early in the morning when they're doing their hunting, um, and I'll talk about that, the certain adaptations they have as nocturnal animals. Um, so the first Animal we have is a California Ridge Ways Rail, and we like to call this animal Cali for short. And Olivia will play a short um, audio clip of what Cali sounds sounds like, so you can maybe hear her in the salt marsh if you get a chance. <laughs> I might awesome. play that one more time just so we get a good one. So it sort of makes a kick a kick noise. So if you're in a wetland habitat and you hear that noise, you might be lucky enough uh, to see Callie. Uh, Callie is about the size of a, of a chicken. She doesn't fly that much. She only flies away if she needs to escape a predator or if she's escaping um, rising tide. Uh, she uses her, her orange beak there to eat little critters in the mud, um, like worms and crustaceans and fish. Um, her home is the salt marsh, so you can see her. She's very elusive, so she doesn't like to be out and about. She likes to hide in the salt marsh amongst the plants. Um, and Callie is adapted to living in the salt marsh, so she has a cool ability to drink salt water, which not a lot of animals can do. Um, so she has a special gland in her body, which allows her to filter the salt um, so that she can drink salt water and still remain alive. So you'll see Callie, hopefully, if you get to visit the wetland, you'll see she has um, brown, um, sort of black feathers and an orange beak with orange legs. Our second um, endangered species is the beloved salt marsh harvest mouse that we like to call salty for short. Um, looking at salty, you can see that some clues to hint that this animal is nocturnal it has very big, large eyes, um, so you can see in the dark, also has um, very big ears so it can hear long distances. Um, in this picture, you notice it's very, it's nesting in a plant that we call pickleweed. Pickleweed is its very, its favorite um, food and also uses uh, this plant for home. I see it, I see a comment here. So, yeah, so yes, both of these, both of these species are endangered um, due to habitat loss. They've lost a lot of our, um, their salt marsh homes. Um, and also they also um, face predators, so salty, um, Birds will try to eat salty. Callie might even try to eat salty. Um, salty also only lives for nine months. So not a long time um, to meet someone special and to start a family. So that's another reason why um, this animal's endangered. Um, salty also has a special gland so it can drink salt water. And salty is only the size of my thumb, so very small. I haven't been able to see salty yet, but I hope to one day. Um, and our scientists are working very hard to monitor salty um, and to make sure that we're providing enough habitat um, and healthy ecosystems for salty su to survive. And right now we're gonna show a video to show you how scientists study endangered species like salty. I'm Laureen Barthman Thompson. I am an environmental scientist with Department of Fish and Wildlife. We are on Grizzly Island Wildlife Area. This is what they call their crescent unit, and we're going to go out and do our annual saltmarsh harvest mouse surveys today. 
They're an endangered species listed both by the state and the federal government. Um, they are the only mammal that's endemic to salt marshes and they're only found within the Sassoon Marsh, San Pablo Bay, and San Francisco Bay. So we're conducting monitoring to look at the population to see what can be done to help improve their numbers. So this morning we're going to go out and see how many animals actually have gone into the traps during the evening. We put the traps out um, a couple days early. They are closed. They are baited so the animals get used to them. They have um, bird seed and walnut in them um, and batting. So it's like a little bed and breakfast we call it. Um, we will take them out. We're going to measure them. We need to be able to identify them compared to western harvest mice which are very similar in size and appearance. Um, so the measurements will help us identify them. A lot of times we will mark them with an individual hair clip or an ear tag and then we release them. Today is our last day at Crescent Unit. Um, I believe we probably only caught four animals here today. We are going to be going to our Hill Slough Unit so we expect to catch a lot more animals there. We are also going to continue with a three-year study at Joyce Island and then at Goodyear, which is way on the other side of the margin. It's a lot more saline there. Um, lots of animals there. Um, and that site and the Joyce site are both a paired tidal and dike wetland. So we're able to compare um, animals on one habitat versus the other to see what are the differences. Are they moving different? Is the flooding regime different? Is the weather different? Um, you know how the population's doing. We have a hundred traps set out here. We can catch up to 80 animals at this location. Our numbers are really low this year because we have had so much rain um, and the area was flooded for most of the winter time but next year we really expect the numbers to have a huge increase. Okay, it's about... you all enjoyed that short video about Salty um, and got a better idea of how our scientists try to monitor their population. Um, so now we're going to take a closer look at uh, the habitats that our animals call home. So we're going to go over five different habitats and as we do so I'd like you all to notice some differences or similarities between each and things that stand out to you. Um, I also like to mention that um, these habitats and the endangered species I mentioned are all the reasons why um, this area was established as a national wildlife refuge. And so four out of the five habitats that we're going to be talking about are wetlands. Um, they're wetland habitats, wetland ecosystems, and wetland is basically just an area where land and water meet. Um, so specifically for our section in the southern San Francisco Bay, um, that means it's submerged underwater either seasonally, year round, or potentially daily. So we're talking about tides that come in and out like you would see at the beach. We have tides that come in and flood parts of the marsh in certain areas. Um, most of our marshes are also controlled um, by us. We have levees put in, which are big land masses so that we can control the water levels in certain areas to make sure that it's the perfect amount for our species. Um, so that will fluctuate and the species have to be able to adapt to those different wetlands. Um, and the first habitat we're going to talk about that's wetland habitat is the salt marsh. And we have a quick video for you there. Salt marsh is one of our wetland habitats covering 37% of the refuge. Salt marshes are seasonally flooded with water and as a result, they are rich in nutrients and therefore support a variety of plants and wildlife. Historically, this type of habitat lined almost the entire San Francisco Bay. Approximately 80 to 90% of salt marshes have been lost due to development. As our population and cities grow, Salt marshes continue to be threatened by development. It is important that we protect marshes because they provide many crucial environmental services to surrounding communities. Marshes provide flood protection acting as a sponge, slowing down and soaking up the water during storms, 
high tides, and sea level rise. Marshes are blanketed by plants which provide oxygen and sequester carbon dioxide, thus helping mitigate climate change. Marshes also act as filters. Salt marsh plants absorb pollutants before they reach the bay and open water. Marshes are an essential habitat for many wildlife species, including those that are endangered and threatened. Marshes are also places where people can come and bike, view wildlife, and connect to the natural world. Great, so that was our salt marsh habitat. Um, so in the chat, if you'd like, you can write what you noticed about the salt marsh, what things stood out, maybe some questions you have. Something that really stands out for me about the salt marsh that you got to see in the video is it's very flat and blanketed with plants. Uh, so there are two main plants that are in the salt marsh. First is pickleweed, um, which I talked about with Salty's favorite food. And the second is alkali heath. Uh, both of these plants are adapted to living in salt water, which not many plants like. Um, so they've learned how to get rid of salt and they do so in different ways. So pickleweed, um, once it absorbs salt water, it'll push the salt to the very tips. Those tips will turn a red orange color and then they'll fall off. So that's how pickleweed gets rid of salt. And alkali heat gets rid of salt just the way humans do, uh, they just sweat it out. So in the picture, you can see small uh, salt crystals on the leaves and that's just alkali heat getting rid of salt. And it has very nice small uh, pink purple flowers during this time. So those are our two main plants in the salt marsh. And here are some examples of animals that you'll see um, if you get the chance to visit a salt marsh. Some of these might be uh, familiar to you. First is the American avocet, uh, which is a shorebird. Very interesting. Um, it changes its color. So you'll notice in this picture it has uh, orange uh, feathers in its neck and head. Um, and they change this color during breeding season um, to attract mates. So both males and females will change colors. And then afterwards, after mating season is done, um, they'll change back to a white color. Uh, then we have a snowy egret. Um, in this picture, you're not able to see it, but it has long legs and then feet um, that are yellow. And so they use their feet to attract fish, sort of how um, we go fishing and we use lures to attract fish. Um, their feet are yellow, so the fish will go towards their feet and the snowy egrets will use its long beak to capture uh, the fish in the water. And of course we have tiny, tiny creatures in the salt marsh water, a bunch of them. Um, a common one is the water boatman, that small um, insect looking creature in the right hand picture. All right, so that was the salt marsh. We're gonna move on to our second habitat, which is the salt pond. The refuge is a common stop for birds who fly along the Pacific Flyway. The Pacific Flyway is a flight path used by birds who travel from breeding grounds to overwintering areas. You can think of the Pacific Flyway like an interstate highway. And the refuge is a gas station or a hotel that birds stop to rest and refuel. The refuge hosts over 280 species of birds each year. On their long journeys, some birds will stop here in the salt pond behind me to rest and refuel. This salt pond habitat was initially a salt marsh that was converted to a salt collection pond and then restored back to a natural habitat. Islands were then added to provide useful habitat for birds. You'll mostly see waterfowl and seabirds using the pond, such as white pelicans, double crested cormorants, California gulls, and Caspian terns. The islands in the pond were created as resting and nesting areas for birds. In the spring, scientists will put Caspian tern decoys on the island and turn on a speaker that plays tern calls in order to attract Caspian terns to the islands. Terns are causing problems in Oregon because they are feeding on a significant amount of juvenile salmon. 
We want Caspian terns to nest here instead of traveling to Oregon and negatively impacting salmon populations. More salt ponds on the refuge are being converted to natural habitats to support the birds that migrate to this area throughout the year. Awesome. So like Rachel said in that video, um, our salt ponds have been um, slowly restored to a place where our other bird species love to hang out. Um, my favorite, I think, being the American white pelican. You've probably seen these. Um, this photo on the left I like here because it has that really pronounced bump on its bill or beak. Um, and that's actually something that both male and female grow during the mating seasons, kind of like their little signal to each other saying like, hey, I'm single, ready to mingle. Um, and then it'll actually shed and fall off um, as soon as the mating season is over. Um, and they enjoy uh, feeding on these striped bass here, um, which is actually not supposed to be in the salt pond. Um, they're sometimes dropped in accidentally by other birds that fly over. And then they've created their own population, which is great for the pelican. Um, and also for their best friend, the double crested corn. Cormorants. So the pelicans and the cormorants interact with each other daily. They um, hunt together. So the way that the pelicans will hunt um, together in one, it's like this in really interesting group feeding activity. Um, they'll actually herd schools of fish together and then in like one big circle and then I'll take turns um, actually feeding on those. And the cormorants will actually join in on that. So they come in, they help do that, and then they will feed at the same time. They also have sleepovers. So those islands that Rachel talked about that have been placed in the salt marsh, um, they both nest on those and they're known to nest together, which is pretty cool because they're two pretty different bird species, um, but they're best friends and they love hanging out. Um, and the pelicans have some pretty cool adaptations and we'll hopefully see the video is a little fuzzy, but hopefully you'll be able to kind of see the motion that I'm talking about. Um, but pelicans have um, these giant bills and you can see my little pelican friend here, we've named him Hubert. Um, their entire bill um, slash beak has this pouch at the bottom that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, and that can actually expand as they feed. So it can actually hold up to three gallons of water, which is pretty cool. Um, but basically they'll go down with their heads like I'm about to show in the video um, and they can dip their heads into the water. And so you can see that motion, they're dipping their heads in, um, trying to get some fish. So they'll pick up food, which is mainly gonna be some fish, some insects and things like that. Um, but it'll be fish that they'll get and tons of water in. And then they actually dip their heads back and the water pours out and then they can swallow the fish, which is a pretty cool adaptation. And it's um, a great hunting method for them because they can get all of it at once, spit out the water basically, and then swallow all the fish that they get. And then they can actually shrink their little pouch folds back in um, when they're not feeding, which is pretty cool. Um, and here's just one more little aerial view of our salt pond habitats. Um, if you've ever flown in a plane over the San Francisco Bay, you might have seen these different colored ponds. Um, and like Rachel mentioned, they were used to harvest salt and some of them still are active salt um, harvesting areas. But you might be wondering why these are kind of like a fun, um, pretty pink and orange red colors. And that's actually because of algae. So you might normally think of algae as kind of these green ponds that you see here. But depending on the amount of salt in the water, which we call salinity, it's how you measure the amount of salt that's in the water, um, different salinity will actually allow the algae to turn a different color. So it'll change depending on the depth of the water, how much salt's in it. And that's a pretty cool way. So you can just kind of be able to tell that from above. And we are now gonna move on to our last two or second to last two habitats. So this is a slough and a mud flat. Um, so it's actually a two for one. And they'll explain in the video how it's actually one area, but depending on the time of the day, it gets to be two habitats. This wetland landscape features two habitats. When the channels are filled up with water, we call that habitat the slough. At low tide, when the water flows back into the bay, 
and the mud is exposed, we call that habitat the mud flats. Slough water is brackish, meaning it is a mix of salt water from the bay and fresh water from Coyote Creek. This slough is unique because it also carries treated fresh water that comes from the Santa Clara Regional Wastewater Facility. Sloughs flow through the marsh habitat and provide transportation for ancestral indigenous communities, collectively known today as the Ohlone people. You can see tall, reed-like plants called tule growing along the edges of the slough. The Ohlone people use tule to create boats, shelter, hunting decoys, mats, clothing, and many more materials. Now that it is low tide, we can see the mud flats. At low tide, birds will flock here to feed on the snails, the worms, and the clams in the mud. Birds will use their long and narrow beaks to eat the small creatures in the mud. The mud flats is often a hidden habitat that when revealed becomes a feasting ground for birds. Okay, so hopefully that video gave you a good idea of how these two habitats are in one space. And so when the water comes in with the tide, different animals will like that. So they come in to feed a lot of ducks, um, a lot of other species like our North American river otter, which will come in um, and fish come in like this staghorn sculpin here. Um, and one of my favorites is the great blue heron. So they'll hang out there most of the time. They actually nest in that tule grass that um, our other colleague Tracy was showing you there. Um, so they'll nest there and they feed and they hunt. Um, and you can actually see, I love this photo, great big wingspan. It's about six feet. Um, so it's pretty amazing that it has such a large wingspan. It's a very large bird, um, but it's actually only about five to six pounds. Um, like most bird species, the herons have hollow bones that are actually filled with air. And instead of us, like you think our bones are filled with bone marrow, they're very lightweight. So it's only about six pounds. Um, and they also have, you can see that long neck there. Um, they can scrunch it down like this. And so when they're hunting, they can actually strike at prey from a distance. Like you would almost imagine like a snake doing that, but it has these special vertebrae, those bones in their neck that can actually jump out really quickly um, while they're hunting, which is something that they're, you know, especially able to do. Um, and here's just a quick video about how it feeds. They love hunting for fish, crab, shrimp, insects, rodents, and even other water birds. Um, and they're also very well adapted to hunt at nighttime. So you'll definitely, a species that you could definitely see during the day, um, but they have, their eyes have adapted to be able to hunt at night as well. So in a habitat like a slough and a mudflat where things are constantly changing, it allows them to be adaptable and hunt at any time when they need to get food. Um, and a few other species that like to come out um, when the mudflats are exposed. Um, specifically, a lot of these that are birds that are trying to get mussels like this shown, clams, crabs, other little crustaceans that like to bury themselves in the mud. Um, usually it's about three to four inches that they can actually bury themselves down in there. So birds like the willet over here on the right are actually really good at using those long beaks at digging into the mud um, to get those. Um, and then there's birds like the coots who actually enjoy swimming on the water, but um, well, actually you can see with their long feet there, they prefer to walk through the mud flats and the shallow water. Um, and they actually look like a duck, but they're not, they're actually rails. So that means that they are in the same family as Cali. So they're actually more closely related to Cali, which is pretty cool. And here is our last habitat that we're gonna talk about and it is the upland habitat. So remember this one is not a wetland, but it is an important part of the Don Edwards Refuge. habitat. As you can see, we are higher up than all the other habitats. This is also our freshwater habitat. Water comes from below the surface and from rain and morning dew. 
It might be hard to imagine, but this area used to be a landfill, and there was still materials buried under the ground from the 1906 San Francisco earthquake that affected buildings in San Jose. The upland here is also called the Butterfly Garden. It is a restoration site where countless volunteers and staff members work to remove invasive species and plant native California plants. There are plenty of California native plants here that provide food and shelter for much wildlife. In addition, this garden is a way station for monarch butterflies. Monarch butterflies visit the garden along their long migration from Canada and northern parts of the United States to mountains in central Mexico. Monarchs will stop here to drink the nectar of milkweed flowers and other flowers in the garden. Monarchs will also lay their eggs on milkweed. Monarch larvae and caterpillars only eat milkweed as they develop. Once the caterpillars transform into butterflies, they will continue the long migration. The upland provides food, shelter, and space for wildlife. In addition, the upland shows visitors the importance of planting California native plants. All right, so that was our upland habitat, maybe more familiar um, to where you live or different parks that you go to. I um, mean, we have a lot of California native plants in this space. Um, one of them is the California buckeye, um, this large tree that has beautiful white flowers and a cone shape. Um, and then they have large um, seeds or fruits um, that are actually poisonous, so we don't wanna eat those. Uh, we also have a lot of flowering plants like black sage. So we attract a lot of pollinators. Uh, pollinators are any animals like bees, butterflies, beetles that move pollen from one plant to another, helping plants uh, reproduce, helping plants make more plants. So we're a very important place for pollinators. Uh, another plant that we have that you've probably seen um, outdoors is the coyote bush. And you can really notice coyote bush because it has these um, white seeds um, that kind of look like fur. So I believe that's why this plant came to be known as coyote bush. Um, and as I mentioned in the, in the video, um, our upland area used to be a landfill. So all the pictures that you see, um, these are plants that um, our volunteers and staff members have planted to make this more of a habitat for wildlife and for us to enjoy. And some of the animals that you'll see in the upland, um, monarchs, um, butterflies that come to drink up nectar and flowers. Um, as I said, monarchs, um, travel long distances when they migrate, so they use the upland as a place to rest and refuel uh, to lay their eggs as well. Uh, we have many songbirds, um, birds of prey, um, birds like hummingbirds in the upland. Uh, this is the Anna's hummingbird. Um, this is actually a male hummingbird, and you can tell because it has that red, um, pink um, feathers around its head. One of my favorite birds. Um, and then we have red foxes that actually come out um, at night. I actually got to take this picture uh, because I was using my uh, wildlife viewing tips, I didn't want to get too close. Um, so we do have red foxes that call the upland area home as well. All right, so we talked a lot about habitats, but why are they important to us? We mentioned why they're important to wildlife, but uh, what is in it for us to protect these habitats? Um, so these habitats um, create a space for us um, to enjoy the environment, and they also provide us ecosystem services. So those are benefits that healthy ecosystems provide for humans. Uh, wetlands specifically, uh, they provide us oxygen. So as you see in the videos um, and the pictures, wetlands are blanketed with plants. So they are producing oxygen so we can breathe. And they're also storing carbon, which is very important as we face climate change. Uh, they also act as a sponge. So we had a question in the chat, uh, do wetlands help with floods? And the answer is yes. So they'll, um, the plants in the soil have the capability of absorbing some of the water that comes during storm surges or floods. Um, so that it protects our communities, especially us that are living along the edge of the bay. Uh, wetlands also protect the bay from pollution. They act as a filter. Um, so as water travels through the wetlands and through the refuge, um, pollutants will soak up into the sediment and plants. And so those pollutants won't enter the bay, won't enter the ocean eventually. So very important. Um, and of course, 
Uh, wetlands are a place where we can enjoy nature, we can relax, we can recreate, um, take wildlife photography, view wildlife. So those are the many reasons why these habitats are important for us and important for us to protect and conserve for the future. And one of those ways that we can help protect those ecosystems is actually through our watersheds. So you might think, you know, I don't live near this wetland. I don't near, live near there, but we are all connected by the same watershed. And a watershed um, is the term that we use to talk about an area of land where all of this water drains to the same place. So if you're thinking about rain up in the hills that washes down into our streams, rain in our streets that washes into storm drains, eventually all of that goes into creeks, eventually through our wetlands and into the bay. So whether there's a plastic bottle that goes into a storm drain or pet waste that somebody didn't pick up, all of that eventually gets washed downstream. Um, and it's important for us to be good upstream stewards because we don't exactly know what's getting flushed downstream. Um, and one quick example of that, you might've heard that um, it's not safe to eat fish in, from the San Francisco Bay, and that's because of mercury, which is a heavy metal. Um, and so the mercury that's in the bay, most of it is actually from the gold rush. So this photo you can see is actually from the 1850s. It's quite a long time ago. Um, and this is mercury that was used to mine gold. And all of that mercury still washes down every year, um, which is kind of crazy to think about. It's a little bit scary that, you know, something that happened so long ago can still have a big impact. Um, but it's important to, you know, understand exactly how our human impacts will affect um, those habitats as well. Um, and this one actually did lead to a good thing. In 1884, California passed its first ever environmental protection law, which we've only grown from there in creating policy that will hopefully help protect these habitats forever. Um, and if we all do little bits, take little steps, we've got a list on the next slide here of things that we can all do, whether it's just picking up trash, um, some things that we can help and prevent storm water runoff. So that's what we call is pollution, um, is storm water pollution. That is what gets dumped down to the streams. And if we all do little things, we can help keep our habitat safe and beautiful like this. Um, and here's just that list. I think my favorite one on here is just to take what you learned today. It's number one, take what you learned today, talk about it with your friends and family, ask questions, learn more, because um, we can all do little things, whether it's just picking up litter, picking up after your pets, things like that. Um, but, you know, together we can all make an impact by just doing these little things. Awesome. So, yes, we can all work together to make sure these um, environments and habitats remain healthy for wildlife, but also for us and for our enjoyment. Um, so I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we covered a lot, but we hope it inspires you to visit the refuge in person if you can. Uh, we'll stop here for any questions. Um, this is our information. So if you wanna check out our website, we also have a Facebook that you can follow that we post events and full posts. Um, if you wanna email us directly, we have our email there. And if you want to learn more about watersheds, you can visit mywatershedwatch.org. So thank you all again for joining us. I hope um, you get to go out there and view wildlife and enjoy all the open spaces that are here for you to enjoy and are here for you to um, protect for future generations. So thank you again. Thank you all so much. And we definitely have time for questions now. I haven't been able to look at the chat, but Rachel, you might have a better idea. Um, but we are very happy to take any questions. Yes, there's a question about wildlife. And I guess we didn't define it too well in the beginning, but wildlife are um, plants and animals that live in a specific region um, that are not domesticated. So not like our pets or not animals that are raised um, um, for food production. So wild animals. And that does include our kind of more urban animals like raccoons that you might not really imagine, but they are in our urban and suburban areas and also out on the refuge. So they exist in both, just like we do. And our refuge trails are open right now. So, um, and there's no fee to visit. So um, again, we hope we can visit in person and get to see all the wildlife that we talked about today in person and up close. Yeah, I see maybe one hand raised. I'm not sure if that's somebody might still have a question.
Well, like Rachel said, um, we do have our website, our Facebook page, as well as our email, which is um, at the very top of the chat, and I can put that in again. Um, but if you do have any other questions, um, feel free to reach out and ask us anything. Um, our website is great, has tons of activities um, for families and for anybody um, that involves all the refuge and a lot of the topics that we covered today. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Rachel and Olivia. Again, if you guys have questions, send it to them. Um, I'm sure they have lots of more information to share with you. And if you guys want to rewatch this uh, webinar, you can go to our YouTube channel and rewatch it again. We will have it up there for at least maybe 48 hours. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us and thank you for um, Olivia and Rachel for joining us as well. Thank you.